Ladies and gentlemen, I shall begin by reading a letter. It was written by a young man to his mother. As you listen to it, I'd like you to observe and to evaluate the thinking processes that this letter reflects. Quote, Dear Mother, Today I am feeling better than yesterday. I really don't feel much like writing, but I love to write to you. After all, I can tackle it twice. Yesterday, Sunday, I would have been so happy if you and Louise and I could have gone to the park. One has such a lovely view from Stefan's castle. Actually, it's very lovely in Bergolsley. Louise wrote Bergolsley on her last two letters. I mean to say on the envelopes. No, the couverts which I received. However, I have written Bergolsley in the spot where I put the date. There are also people in Bergolsley who call it Holzleberg. Others talk of a factory. I'm writing on paper. The pen which I'm using is from a factory called Perry and Company. This factory is in England. I assume this. Behind the name of Perry Company, the city of London is inscribed, but not the city. The city of London is in England. I know this from my school days. Then I always liked geography. My last teacher in that subject was Professor August A. He was a man with black eyes. I also liked black eyes. There are also blue and gray eyes and other sorts, too. I've heard it said that snakes have green eyes. All people have eyes. There are some, too, who are blind. These blind people are led about by a boy. It must be very terrible not to be able to see. There are people who can't see, and in addition can't hear. I know some who hear too much. One can hear too much. There are many sick people in Bergolsley. One of them I like a great deal. He taught me that in Bergolsley there are many kinds. Then there are some who are not here at all. They are all peculiar people. Unquote. Now you will all immediately grasp that this letter is not the product of a rational thinking process. But identify why and how you know this. What did you observe about the letter that led you to this conclusion? What you observed was this, that the various thoughts that compose the letter are not linked or logically connected by any central theme. The writer wanders mentally. His ideas ramble without any intelligible progression. Each sentence is connected to the next by some chance association, not by a logical connection. The total is a grab bag of separate, unrelated thoughts. And although each separate sentence is formally grammatical and does convey a meaning, the sentences lead nowhere, and the total has no meaning. What the letter crucially lacks is the unifying, integrating factor of purpose. The writer of this letter is a catatonic schizophrenic. I was quoting from Eugene Bleuler's famous monograph on schizophrenia, Dementia Praecox. The letter was presented as an example of schizophrenic thinking. A major symptom of schizophrenia is the deterioration of the thinking process, a deterioration that's made manifest in the schizophrenic's inability to hold to a single purpose and to unify and integrate his thoughts around that purpose in a logical progression. Thinking in the literal and rational meaning of the word is a purposeful mental activity having knowledge of reality as its goal. Whether it be a child's first attempt to grasp the difference between a dog and a cat or an abstract philosopher's attempt to define the fundamental nature of reality, it's the presence of a purpose that crucially distinguishes a rational process of thought from the lunatic ramblings of a schizophrenic. Wherever there is thought, there is purpose, a purpose setting and directing every step of the thinking activity. But just as a focus must be volitionally set and maintained, so a purpose must be volitionally set and maintained. In order to think, 
A mind must choose and then hold to its mental goal. That is, the problem to be solved or the concept to be grasped. This will not happen automatically. It requires an act of mental decision. It requires self-consciousness, an awareness of what one's mind is doing, and direction and control of what one's mind is doing. Now, certainly most people's minds don't function quite like the schizophrenic who wrote the letter I quoted. But neither are most people purposeful and self-conscious about the activities of their minds. And as a result, the mental processes of people who would consider themselves rational and intelligent are too often frighteningly similar to those of the schizophrenic writer. The difference, as I'll demonstrate, is one of degree. Everyone recognizes that a child isn't born knowing how to talk, to walk, to read, to write, that he must learn how to do these things. But everyone assumes that somehow a child and an adult does automatically know how to think. Everyone assumes that thinking is in effect an instinct, something that one just knows how to do and that no process of study or learning is required. Well, if you believe this, check your premises. If you were to stop a dozen people at random, give them a problem to think about, and later ask them to report on what their minds had proceeded to do in order to solve the problem, you would discover that they had engaged in quite different kinds of mental activity but all of them called their mental activity thinking. You would discover that when people use the word thinking, they very often use it to name quite different kinds of mental activities, some of which are effective in gaining knowledge, some of which are grossly ineffective. People customarily take their own mental processes as self-evidently valid, as not to be questioned. They don't seek to correct or improve faulty methods of thinking because it doesn't even occur to them to consider their methods of thinking. As a result, inefficient methods, once initiated, harden into habits, which are then practiced automatically. And one's thinking processes continue to deteriorate, and one is less and less able to solve problems, less and less able to deal with reality, and to direct one's life intelligently. And those who have never properly learned to think are, of course, always the quickest to conclude that the mind is impotent, that thinking is not the means to acquire knowledge. They do not question the nature of their own mental processes. They question instead the efficacy of reason. Inefficient methods of thinking are the greatest of all destroyers of intelligence. Whatever a man's potential intellectual capacity, his actual ability to deal with problems can be no better than his method of thinking, no better than his method of using that capacity. The greatest brain on earth could not solve the simplest of problems if he approached it by the method of the schizophrenic letter writer. You have all heard the saying, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. If you look at the manner in which most men run their lives, you will conclude that it's more accurate to say, whom the gods would destroy, they first make stupid. But this stupidity is not the result of a deficient brain. It's a self-made stupidity, a stupidity that is the inexorable result of inefficient thinking processes. A high intellectual capacity is only a potential which its possessor must learn how to use. Let me give you an illustration. A young man is about to enter college, and he's attempting to decide whether to enroll in College A or College B. He goes to his room for the purpose of thinking this problem over. Now here we'll tune in on his inner mental processes. There's a very good professor with a brilliant reputation at College A. 
But College B is more convenient to travel to from home. Mm, I wonder if Dad will buy me a car. I like the new Thunderbird. The gray and white one I saw was great. Ah, Dad's a tightwad. He said he'd get me a car, but he'll probably change his mind. Carol is going to College A, I think. I don't see much of her these days. I wonder who she's been going out with. Oh, yes, the fees at both colleges are the same, so there's really no issue there. I think I'll give Carol a call tonight. Now, I wonder which college has a better selection of courses. That would be important to know. I'd rather like the powder blue Thunderbird, too. They say college is much more difficult than high school. But I'll do all right. I've always been a good student. But how the devil am I going to decide which college to attend? At this point, the boy's father enters the room and asks him what he's been doing. The boy answers that he's been thinking very hard about which college to attend, but somehow he can't seem to decide. Now the question is, has this boy been thinking? The connections between his thoughts were certainly more understandable than those of the schizophrenic. But observe the very significant similarities. Here again, there was no logical relationship between one thought and the next. There was no consistently followed purpose dominating and integrating the sequence of thoughts. The mental process was essentially passive. The boy didn't direct the actions of his mind. Rather, he was simply the observer of associations made by his subconscious. If one may compare the mind to a car, then this boy didn't drive the car, he just went along for the ride. Ask yourselves how often you have engaged in a similar mental process and called it thinking. To the extent that you do so, the difference between that boy and you on the one hand and the schizophrenic on the other is that the boy and you can reassert and reestablish control over the function of your mind by choosing to do so. The schizophrenic cannot. What should the boy have done instead? Well, in essence, his thinking process should have followed a pattern such as this. Why am I going to college? To train myself for my future profession. Then which college, A or B, can, to the best of my knowledge, best further this end? There are three essential criteria. First, the general academic level of the respective colleges. Second, the caliber of the professors in the field I'll be studying. Third, the comprehensiveness of the courses offered in my field at the respective colleges. It seems that the academic level of the two colleges is the same. Both are regarded as of the top rank. Professor R, who teaches at College A, is said to be a brilliant man in his field, and no one has a reputation equal to his at College B. College B, however, offers almost twice as many courses as College A, which means that I could acquire a wider and firmer education there. I think this outweighs the advantage of studying with Professor R. I think, therefore, that I will attend College B. Now, needless to say, the thinking process I just presented is highly simplified. But it does reflect the essence of the right approach, the establishment of a purpose, the asking and answering of relevant questions, and a deduction from one's answers that is consonant with one's original purpose. Now, if it happened that in comparing the three aspects of colleges A and B, he found them to be equal, the boy would then be free to decide which to attend by another and less fundamental standard, such as perhaps which college was more physically convenient to reach from home or which college Carol was attending. But then he would have to know that he was no longer judging by academic or scholastic criteria, and he would have to know why he was justified in acting on some other standard. I have compared the mind to a car. To continue the metaphor, we call the process of active, purposeful thinking front seat driving. 
and we call passive associational thinking backseat driving. Let me explain why. Consider what one does when one is the driver of a car, sitting behind the wheel and heading toward a chosen destination. The front seat driver first must know exactly where he intends to go. Then he must direct the motion of the car toward his chosen goal by the shortest and most efficient route. He must, as he drives, watch constantly for road signs, signs that will tell him that he's proceeding in the right direction. He must constantly be in total control of what's occurring. He must deliberately choose and direct each step of his progression. Now consider in contradistinction to this what one does when one is the passenger of a car, just along for the ride, when one is a backseat driver. The backseat driver has no purpose in the sense of a destination that he has assumed the responsibility of reaching. He's passive with regard to the final goal of the car. He's simply being carried along and is neither initiating nor influencing the motion and direction of the car. He sits passively, observing whatever scenery the car may happen to pass, ending up wherever the car may happen to stop. The scenery he sees is the scenery that rolls by his window, and he is only its passive contemplator. In the same way, the backseat driver of thought doesn't choose a final goal, a destination, a purpose to his mental activity. He is mentally carried along passively. He doesn't direct the progression of his thought. He merely observes whatever his subconscious feeds him by chance association. And the conclusion or decision, if any, which he finally reaches in his thinking, is determined not by facts, not by logic, but by whatever random ideas, memories, emotions, and images happen to lead him. The first attribute, then, of efficient, rational thinking is that it be purposeful, that it be goal-directed. The thinker must consciously, deliberately choose his purpose, that is, choose the problem to be solved, the question to be answered. Now, once that purpose is chosen and is clearly defined, the means of holding to it and never deviating from it is to set oneself sub-purposes, which means to raise and to answer relevant questions. Here again, the analogy of a front seat driver of a car will be useful. The front seat driver heading for a specific destination in Connecticut must know that there are certain signs along the way, signs indicating turns and highways and street names, that will tell him that he's moving toward, not away from, his ultimate goal. In the same manner, the front seat driver of thought must know the markers along his mental road. He must know the questions that have to be asked and answered, the sub-problems that must be solved along the way to his ultimate goal. The boy in the second and rational example of thinking which I gave you first defined his problem to decide between two colleges. Then he defined three sub-problems that had to be solved before he could find the answer. The academic level of the two colleges, the caliber of the professors, and the comprehensiveness of the courses offered. He knew that these were the three questions that had to be asked and answered in order for him to know which college to attend. It is this process of question asking and answering, the setting up of sub-problems, which keeps one's main purpose functioning as a mental directing agent. Either the asking of the right questions will give you the answer, if you already possess the necessary knowledge in your subconscious, or the questions will tell you what you have to find out. You will remember that in the second lecture of this course, Mr. Brandon discussed the nature and function of the subconscious. He explained that the subconscious is the sum of all of one's perceptions, identifications, associations, and conclusions 
on which the mind is not presently and actively focused. And he described the nature of the relationship between the subconscious storehouse and the presence of a goal or purpose held in the conscious mind as follows. And I quote, It is the goal or purpose a mind has set in any given instance that determines what material out of the total content of the mind's knowledge will be fed to it from the subconscious. For instance, if a man chooses to think about a specific issue in economics, to solve the problem of what determines the prices paid for goods, it is the material relevant to that issue that will flow into his conscious awareness. His subconscious will feed him for his consideration such knowledge as he possesses about supply, demand, production, consumption, trade, etc. But if a man does not clearly know what it is that he wants to know, if he does not have a clearly defined purpose, a clearly defined problem to solve, if he decides just to think about economics with some vague generalized aim, the knowledge he requires from his subconscious filing system will not be forthcoming. His mind will wander aimlessly among chance bits of knowledge and random connections. He will find himself unable to concentrate and will soon give up the attempt as futile. Like an electronic computer, the subconscious requires exactitude of the orders it receives if it is to function efficiently. And if it is given contradictory orders, it will not function at all. The failure to solve a problem is often caused by the absence of a precise, unequivocal definition of the problem one wishes to solve. A purpose in a mind acts in relation to the subconscious as a standard of selection, without which no thought is possible. When a mind abandons purpose, it abandons thinking, and what drifts through it from the subconscious is determined not by logic, but by association." Unquote. Thus, the failure to define an exact purpose in thinking makes one's stored knowledge unavailable and useless to the conscious mind, just as if one had learned nothing in the past and had stored no knowledge whatever. The boy in the first and irrational example of thinking that I gave you, who attempted to decide between the two colleges in a backseat manner, may have had filed away in his subconscious all of the information he required in order to make a rational decision. But because he was backseat driving, that knowledge was not available to him, and his problem was, for all practical purposes, unsolvable. By his method, he might have made a disastrously wrong choice of colleges, deciding on the whim of the moment or by the pressure of a friend, despite the fact that he possessed both the intelligence and the knowledge which could have permitted him to make the right choice. Now consider another and related type of mental process in which many people commonly engage when they think they are thinking. A kind of backseat driving which is sometimes mistaken for a purposeful thought process. Because in this case, the mind is not wandering aimlessly, although its aim is not, in fact, the solution of a problem. A man comes home from his office one evening, and he greets his wife as usual. He vaguely notices that she seems strained, but he pays little attention to it. Then, suddenly, she explodes with anger, and she tells him that today is their anniversary and that he has ignored it completely. Feeling guilty, the man becomes defensive and angry, and a bitter quarrel ensues. His wife accuses him of not caring for her, of never having cared for her, while he insists that she's foolish to read any significance into his forgetfulness, and that besides he had serious business problems on his mind. The quarrel mounts in intensity, and finally the wife goes to her room in tears. The husband is upset, 
and he decides to think about the quarrel and its causes. He's determined to understand who is right and who is wrong, and to find a way to resolve the disagreement. What he does is something like this. He pictures first the crowded, stuffy subway he took on his way home. He remembers how tired he was, and that he was looking forward to seeing his wife and to forgetting the day's problems. He mentally recreates his arrival home, then his wife's sudden outburst, then his own feeling of guilt. He rehears mentally the accusations she had leveled against him. He remembers and re-experiences his resulting anger. He repeats in his mind the answers he had given to her accusations and what she had then replied. In this manner, he relives the entire progression of the evening going over every word, every gesture, every expression, every emotion, up to the exit of his wife from the room. Perhaps an hour passes in this manner, at the end of which he is not one iota closer to understanding who is right and who is wrong, or what can be done to effect a reconciliation. He has been engaged in mental activity, but he has not been thinking. His mind hasn't wandered away to unrelated subjects, but he has not been thinking. He has been passively reviewing and re-experiencing past events and his own past emotions. He has not been thinking, he has been stewing. A review is not a process of thought. Running a silent motion picture in one's mind is not a process of thought. Reliving an emotional experience is not a process of thought. Yet the example I have just given is precisely what many people do when they are supposedly thinking. They run precisely this kind of motion picture in their minds. They feel badly, they worry, they sigh, they pace up and down. And then they conclude that despite their best efforts and hardest thinking, they simply cannot solve their problem. Well, what should this man have done instead? What would constitute a process of thinking, of rational mental activity, in a case such as this? First, the man should clearly identify the fact that his problem has two aspects, that two issues are involved, his forgetting of their anniversary and his wife's violent reaction to his forgetting. He might then begin by asking himself if it was right, even considering the pressure of business problems on his mind, to forget their anniversary. He might decide that it wasn't, that objectively his wife did have reason to be offended, that he shouldn't have let his feeling of guilt turn into anger, and that he owes his wife an apology and an explanation. He might then ask himself why his wife had been so quick to assume that he didn't care for her, why she had been so violent in her accusations. Had he given her provocation in the past to make her fear his indifference? Perhaps he decides that he has not been remiss in the past in projecting his feelings for her, that he hasn't given her grounds to be apprehensive about his actual attitude. Perhaps he knows that, as she herself has admitted, she's prone to exaggerate and to be oversensitive. He concludes that she was at fault in drawing the implications she drew from his forgetting. With these conclusions in mind, he can go to his wife, tell her what he has identified, and resolve the quarrel. Now this is, of course, very much foreshortened. There might be a great many more elements for the man to consider. But in essence, this is the rational approach the rational method of facing such problems, the clarifying of the nature of the problem to be solved, then the asking and answering of the sub-problems that have to be understood in order for the main problem to be solved, a purposeful, rational, step-by-step, -step, logically unified process of thought. In order to maintain any purposeful process of thought, 
in order to be a front seat driver. It's necessary, of course, to hold one's mind in full focus. To focus means simply to be aware, to be conscious, to perceive, as opposed to a state of daze of mental fog. The act of focusing the mind is the primary mental act. It's the precondition of purposeful thinking. One cannot think while one is mentally half asleep. But it's important to understand that one's alternative is not between a state of full, clear, sharp mental awareness and a fog-like state of complete daze. There are a great many degrees of mental clarity, a great many degrees of focus in between these two states. Many people spend much of their lives in a state of semi-consciousness. They function as though they were seeing reality from underwater, with a veil blurring their perception. Some people, very few, exist in a state of full mental clarity, of a sharp, luminous awareness. But most shift back and forth in states of awareness which are neither of these two. Let me illustrate just a few of the possible levels of focus. At the very bottom of the scale is the state in which one moves through reality in a passive daze, barely perceiving, making decisions, acting, moving, accepting or rejecting ideas, with one's mind and focus turned off in a virtual epistemological coma. A slightly higher level of awareness is that in which one focuses sufficiently to perceive and to be aware, but one makes no effort to pass judgments. The meaning of what one perceives is not identified. One estimates nothing, evaluates nothing, concludes nothing. In such a state, you might, for instance, hear and understand every word that I'm saying tonight, but form absolutely no judgment on the validity of what you're hearing. You don't ask if what I'm saying is true or false, right or wrong. You hear, but you do not estimate. You perceive, but you do not judge. A slightly higher level of focusing is that in which one both grasps and judges, but one makes no new connections, performs no new active thinking. In this state, you might grasp what I'm saying and estimate it, but nothing more. You do not integrate your perceptions and judgments into the rest of your premises. Perhaps some of the points being made here are relevant to problems of yours. But in this state of awareness, your mind won't make the connection. Your mind isn't set to that level of effort. And so, potentially valuable knowledge passes you by. Another level is what may be called selective focusing. In this state, one is aware of a splintered reality, a partial reality, a segmentalized reality, but not the whole. Bits and aspects but never the total of what one is dealing with. In this state, you might focus now and again on one point or another. Your consciousness comes and goes. It sees one issue and then drifts away. And there is no whole, no sum in your mind. Only the memory of isolated sections and parts, disconnected and unintegrated. Full mental clarity means a state in which one perceives, judges, connects, and integrates the full conceptual meaning of every aspect of that with which one is dealing. One grasps, one judges, one looks for new connections, new applications, new integrations. One assumes the responsibility of full consciousness. Let me illustrate what the state of full focus means in the following way. It's the state of a skilled hunter moving through a jungle. The hunter isn't afraid, but he knows that danger exists and that he must be alert for every sign that will give him warning. 
As he moves, his senses and mind are fully sharp, fully ready, and set to perceive. He will immediately hear any unusual sound. He'll immediately perceive any unusual sight that might signal danger. If he hears an odd sound, he asks himself whether it's a rustle of grass or the hiss of a snake. He interprets and judges everything, and he does so as carefully and accurately as possible. If he sees something new and unknown to him, he does not shrug and turn away because understanding requires too much effort. He knows too clearly that his life depends upon his power to understand, that his survival depends upon the efficiency with which he uses his mind. This is the state of full focus. But it should not be reserved for one's excursions into the jungle. You need it now and at this moment, and in all the moments of your life. You need it at work, you need it in your apartment, you need it walking down the street, you need it when you select a political candidate or a career. People do not use their consciousness in the same way at all times. They focus to different extents in different situations and on different subjects. Sometimes they front seat drive, sometimes they back seat drive. You have all met people who appear remarkably intelligent when dealing with one issue and remarkably stupid when dealing with another. You've all met people who are brilliant in their professions, who can deal with abstract ideas easily and efficiently, but whose personal lives consist of one unnecessary catastrophe after another. It is not their intelligence that varies, it's their use of it. If you wish to know whether or not you are always in full focus, if you wish to know the standard against which to measure yourselves, project how you would read a legal contract involving large sums of money and long-range commitments, a contract affecting your entire future. In such a case, you would be like the jungle hunter. You would be in full focus. You would study the meaning and implication of every word and clause and you wouldn't skip the small print merely because it appeared complex and difficult. You would know that it is precisely the small print that required your undivided attention. You're a front seat driver to the extent that this is your normal and constant mode of mental functioning. Nothing less will do. To the extent that this is not your mode of mental functioning, you're living at less than your intellectual capacity. You're endangering and undercutting your happiness, your fulfillment, your self-esteem, your life. It is the small print of reality which, unread, is the destroyer of human lives. Now you might wish to ask, but what if I'm bored with a certain subject or conversation or person? What if I'm confronted with something that does not interest me? Is it not then legitimate to go out of focus? Well, translated, the meaning of such a question is, is it not legitimate to make myself unconscious, to dissolve my mind in fog, to become less than an animal? If, for instance, you're trapped into listening to a dull conversation, the solution is not to make the boredom bearable by killing your mind. Focus instead on something else, something which does interest you. But if you must join in the conversation, if it's necessary that you speak, then you have to remain focused on it. Your only alternative is to speak and act without knowing what you're doing. To focus means, in essence, to know what you are doing to know what you're doing in existence, and to know what you're doing in consciousness. If you're studying philosophy at college, and you're told that you must take a course in chemistry which doesn't interest you, the solution is not to attend chemistry classes in a day's stupor. Since chemistry interests you less than philosophy, then you rationally and validly will read fewer books on the subject, you'll delve into it less deeply, you'll not attempt to do any original work in it. 
But this doesn't mean that you skim over the books you do read without being conscious of what you're reading. Your premise can legitimately be that you'll learn less, but you will still have to learn what you are learning. You'll still have to know what's being said in class. You will still have to remain conscious. You'll have to be fully as much in focus as when you're studying that which does interest you. What is optional in the life of any man is what he chooses to deal with and to what extent. What is not optional is the mental state in which he deals with whatever concerns him. What is not optional is whether or not he will remain in focus. Are there times when it's proper to give one's mind a rest? Most certainly, if one knows what one is doing. At the end of a busy day, you might come home, fling yourself down on the sofa, empty your mind of any purposeful pursuit, and just float. There's nothing wrong with this, provided you know that you are giving yourself a mental rest. You're in danger only if you don't know the difference between this state and a state of purposeful mental work. To be in focus doesn't mean that one must always be in the pursuit of the solution to a problem. If, for instance, you go to a party, you're not there to solve intellectual problems, but you should be fully as much in focus. All that has changed is the object of your focus. A celebration doesn't mean escape from the responsibility of consciousness. It only means the suspension of productive work. Are there people who need to go out of focus, who need to turn off their consciousness in order to celebrate, in order to feel free to enjoy themselves? Yes, there are. But that is a state of neurosis. These are the people who are running from the knowledge that they have nothing to celebrate, that they have no self-esteem, and that only a self-induced mental stupor can anesthetize their self-loathing. The cardinal tool of thinking done in full focus is language. To illustrate the indispensable role of words as the means by which man retains and symbolizes his abstractions, I'll ask you to try the following experiment. Consider any conviction of yours which you feel confident of your ability to prove, such as the conviction that murder is immoral. Now, and I'm going to give you a moment to do this here, now try to prove this conviction, to prove it in your own minds, but to do so without using any words whatever. From your expressions, I take it that you've observed it cannot be done. There is no way to form or retain your thoughts in consciousness, no way to order them in a logical progression, no way to front seat drive without the use of language. Without language, man cannot sustain a thinking process. People often do attempt, however, to think without language. The result is that they go out of focus. In the place of words, they substitute emotions, images, and memories. But these are not substitutes for clearly formed, verbalized ideas. The conclusion of a syllogism is not reached by the union of an emotion and a mental picture. When people speak to each other, they normally do not intersperse between their sentences picture sketches, and reports on their random emotions. If they did attempt such interspersions, they wouldn't be understood. But most people do not treat their own minds with the respect they grant to the minds of others. They assume that for themselves, any chaotic hodgepodge is good enough. Now, of course, there are people who do speak chaotically and incomprehensibly to others who do mutter inarticulate sounds about their feelings rather than clearly communicate ideas. These are the people who will say, oh, I can't explain it, but I know what I mean. The truth is that such people do not know what they mean. They merely feel what they feel they mean. 
and very often using words literally they don't mean anything at all. A fact which they're spared the discomfort of discovering by never attempting to translate their feelings into words. Of course, it sometimes can happen that a man has a thought for which he isn't immediately able to find the words. The thought is the product of some subconscious integration of ideas. The thought may even be valid. But he does not know what that thought is until he can translate it into words. Knowledge, conceptual knowledge, begins only with the employment of language. Psychologists report that in the process of artistic and scientific creativity, there are many preliminary mental activities that do take place on a subverbal level. And in these activities, various types of imagery usually play a central role. So I don't wish to leave the implication that there's no such thing as subverbal thought. Indeed, not only artists and scientists, but all of us engage in subverbal thought some of the time. But what has to be stressed in this context is that such subverbal processes are at best only one stage, the beginning stage, in the overall process of thought and creativity. A person who is unable to bring his thinking into a verbal, conceptual form is not in control of it and cannot be certain of the validity of any of his conclusions. Language is the acid test of clarity and coherence. Language is the only form in which it's possible to reason explicitly and to subject one's conclusions to the judgment of reason and reality. In order to think, man has to draw abstractions, to form concepts, and to give these concepts identity by means of specific words. As you'll remember from an earlier lecture, abstractions are the identification of that which two or more things have in common. On the perceptual level of awareness, you deal with firm, absolute entities. You perceive things which are what they are. In order to deal with reality on the conceptual level, in order to have your thinking correspond to reality, your concepts and the words you use to denote them have to be as firm and absolute as reality itself. They have to mean what they mean. They have to mean specific entities, attributes, events, or relationships perceived in reality. And only those specific entities, attributes, events, or relationships. If the word green denotes the concept of a certain color attribute, which green grass, green leaves, a green dress, a green rug all have in common, then that is what the word green denotes. That is the identity of the concept. And to remain a concept, it can have no other meaning. If you begin to use the word green indiscriminately and haphazardly, to denote a green object today, a red one tomorrow, a soft object next week, a hot one next month, then the word has become an inarticulate sound, denoting nothing. And the corresponding representation in your mind, which should have been a concept, is now merely a patch of mental fog. The law of identity is the link between metaphysics and epistemology, between existence and consciousness. It is the basic axiom of reality which man must follow as a basic rule in all of his thinking. In reality, things possess identity. They are what they are. In thinking, it is man's mind that has to provide his concepts with identity. He cannot do it by whim or by subjectivist preference. He can do it only by making his concepts denote specific aspects of reality. He has to maintain the absolutism of the law of identity in his mind as totally as it is maintained in reality. If he fails to do this, whatever goes on in his mind is no longer awareness, nor thinking, nor reason, nor knowledge. 
the identity of a concept is its definition. The guardians or destroyers of your mental efficacy, of your intelligence, of your knowledge, of your ability to deal with existence, are the definitions of your concepts and of the words that denote your concepts. When these definitions are absolute in their precision, they are your guardians. The degree of their imprecision, of their vagueness, is the degree to which they become your destroyers. When definitions are precise, they are the tools of thinking. When they are imprecise, they are the impediments, the blocks, the barriers to thought. What is a definition? A definition is a statement that identifies the essential characteristics of the aspect of reality which a concept denotes. A definition names the identity of a concept by naming the essential characteristics of the entity, attribute, event, or relationship which that concept denotes. Well, what do we mean by essential? We mean that which makes a thing what it is and differentiates it from all other things man knows, that without which it would not be the kind of thing it is. For example, suppose we define the concept man as a living being who walks on two legs. Well, this is true of man, but it would not be a definition because it would not name the essential characteristics of man. It would not name that which makes him what he is and differentiates him from all other entities. A man may lose his legs or be unable to walk, but he would still remain a man. Suppose we defined man as a featherless biped. This is true of men, but it is also true of plucked chickens. So it would not be a definition. It would not name that which is true only of man. The proper definition of man is a rational animal. Rational means possessing the faculty of reason. Animal means a living organism possessing the power of locomotion. Now, why do we choose this as essential to the entity that we denote by the concept man? Because without these two characteristics, animality and the faculty of reason, the entity in question would not be a man. If an entity is not an animal but an inanimate object, it is not a man. If an entity is an animal, it may be a man, but it may also be a dog, a bird, or a fish. Now, if we name the characteristic animal and add to it the characteristic rational, that constitutes a full definition because the capacity to reason belongs only to man and differentiates him from all other animals. Concepts denoting the primary material of human knowledge, that is, sensations or sense data, are defined by what's called ostensive definitions. That is, by pointing to the appropriate objects and saying, I mean this. To know or to communicate what I mean by green, I would have to point to several green patches and say this. But higher concepts require a long chain of precise definitions in order to be reduced or brought back or connected to their base in perceptual reality. For example, the concept justice denotes a certain kind of moral principle, and a moral principle denotes a certain kind of estimate, and an estimate denotes a certain kind of choice in the mind of a certain kind of entity, namely man. It was Aristotle who identified the rules by which one formulates definitions of concepts that are not ostensibly defined. In order to formulate a correct definition, a definition that identifies the essentials of a particular class of entities, one must include that class into a wider class and differentiate it from all the other members of that wider class. For instance, when we defined man, we did so by including the class of entities who are men 
into the wider class of animals. And we differentiate men from all other animals by the characteristic that only men possess, the capacity to reason. The two aspects of the process of formulating a definition are called genus and differentia. Genus means the wider or general class in which we include the entities to be defined. Differentia means the characteristic which differentiates these entities from all the other entities included in the genus. The Aristotelian rule and the rule of definitions is a definition must consist of a genus and a differentia. Observe what would happen if you didn't follow this rule. If you omitted the genus and defined man as simply as something that possesses the capacity to reason, you haven't stated what man is. You've named only one of his attributes. Or if you omit the differentia, and define man only as an animal, you haven't separated him from all other animals. You will remember from an earlier lecture that the process of abstraction consists of two parts, isolation and integration, or separating and uniting. The same principle applies to the process of formulating definitions. To define a concept, we integrate it into a genus and isolate it by means of a differentia. We unite it with a wider class and separate it by means of its particular characteristic. In this manner, the filing system of one's subconscious is kept in order, and one's mind knows exactly where to find the meaning of any word or concept it uses. It looks for the meaning of the word man in the category labeled animals and finds the definition pertaining only to man. In this manner, every concept in one's mind has a specific identity, a specific meaning, and is not confused with any other concept. But you must remember that the structure of man's knowledge and of his concepts is hierarchical and so is the structure of his definitions. The precision of any particular definition depends on the precision with which one has defined the concepts it uses. For instance, the precision of the definition man is a rational animal depends on the precision with which one has defined the concepts of animal and rational. All concepts and all definitions have to be filed and cross-filed in one's mind. They have to be identified and integrated. And this process has to be kept up, widened, refined, expanded, with the growth and expansion of one's knowledge. Let me give you an example. When a child first grasps the difference between living beings and inanimate objects, his own first definition of man would be, in effect, a thing that moves and make noises. This would distinguish men from the things that don't move or make noises, from things that are inert, inanimate. And, please note this, it would be a correct, true, valid definition in the context of the child's knowledge. At this stage, the child hasn't yet grasped the difference between men and other animals. You may observe that children need quite a long process of learning before they fully grasp this difference. As the child's knowledge grows, he'll expand his definition of man to a thing that moves, makes noises, walks on two legs, and has no fur, as distinguished from dogs or cats. Again, in the context of his knowledge, this is a perfectly valid definition. He'll need a long time before the definition a rational animal becomes meaningful to him. But, and please note this, when he reaches that stage, he will not find that he has to reverse or contradict his earlier definitions. They were not false, they were true of reality. And now he doesn't have to discard the knowledge they identified. He merely incorporates that knowledge into a definition which includes a much wider knowledge. 
when he now defines man as a rational animal, this definition implies the facts that man moves, makes noises, walks on two legs, and has no fur. All these facts are still true of man, but in the context of an adult's knowledge, these facts are not sufficient to distinguish the concept man from all his other concepts. They are no longer the essential facts. They can no longer serve as a definition. This example illustrates the process by which man gains knowledge and by which he keeps his mental files in rational order as well as the role of definitions in this process. It's a process by which man enlarges the scope of his capacity to differentiate, to discriminate among all the aspects of reality that confront his awareness. In forming or in accepting a new concept, he must always formulate a definition which distinguishes this concept from all his other concepts. Thus he learns to think and to perceive in terms of essentials, in terms of precise, specific differentiations. He learns to endow his concepts with specific meanings, that is, with specific identities. And he keeps his knowledge, his conclusions, his convictions free of any contradiction. Don't make the mistake at this point of deciding that definitions are therefore subjective or relative. Definitions do depend on the total context of a man's knowledge, but the definition which is objectively correct at any stage of his development is the definition that embraces the context of all the knowledge available to him at that time and in that respect. For example, A child's definition of man doesn't clash with our adult definition. It's merely more generalized, less specific, and so is the state of the child's knowledge, and so are the issues with which he deals. But if an adult decided to claim as valid the definition of man as a thing that moves and makes noises, ignoring all the rest of his own knowledge, ignoring all the knowledge available for him to learn, that would be a false subjective definition. Nothing is more disastrous than the kind of conclusions men reach and the kind of actions they attempt when their concepts are devoid of firm, absolute, precise definitions and their knowledge therefore is non-integrated. If you understand what chaos would occur within your consciousness, if you were vague about the meaning and the application of a single concept such as green, you can easily imagine what would happen inside a mind that tries to draw abstractions from abstractions, to integrate concepts into wider concepts, with no precise definitions, no clear understanding of what it is that any of his concepts denote. You can easily imagine what will happen when such a mind tries to function on the level of the higher, more complex abstractions, such as love, poetry, electron, individualism, with gaps in meaning all along his mental chain, with vague approximations and undefined notions, with chaos built on chaos, and fog abstracted from fog. It is on this level and for these reasons that you'll see husbands who declare that love consists of forgiving their most contemptible actions. Aestheticians who declare that poetry consists of sounds without rhyme, rhythm, or meaning. Scientists who declare that electrons have free will. Conservatives who propose to draft everybody into compulsory labor and confiscate everybody's property for the purpose of preserving individualism. If you want to bring order into your mental files and efficiency into your methods of thinking, begin by formulating precise definitions for the concepts you use. You, of course, won't be able to do it all at once. But if, whenever you're considering a problem, You make it a rule to start by defining at least every key concept involved, 
you'll be astonished to what extent it will clarify your thinking and how much easier the task of defining will progressively become. But remember that to define is to differentiate. Remember that a definition must consist of essentials, which means that it must distinguish a particular concept from all the other concepts in your mind. There are many specific and helpful rules to observe in the process of formulating correct definitions. But these rules are extensions and elaborations implied in the basic Aristotelian rule of genus and differentia. Such further rules should be studied in order to achieve full precision in one's method of thinking after one is thoroughly familiar with the basic rule. Tonight I shall discuss only one of these further rules because it's a crucially important corollary of the basic rule and because its breach represents a disastrously widespread error. It is known as the rule of fundamentality. It states that a definition must include the essential and fundamental characteristic of the thing being defined. Fundamental in this context means that which is a primary characteristic, not a secondary consequence, that which is a cause, not an effect. For example, if we define man as a being who possesses the capacity to study algebra, that would be a false definition, a breach of the rule of fundamentality. It's true that man is the only being who possesses the capacity to study algebra, but that capacity isn't a primary. It's merely one of the consequences of a fundamental capacity, of the capacity to reason, which has many other consequences. It's the primary, the fundamental characteristic, the capacity to reason, that is essential to man and distinguishes him from all other living beings, not any secondary consequence of that characteristic. In formulating a definition, then, one cannot pick some attribute at random. One must look for the fundamental characteristic one must consider all the known aspects that distinguish this particular entity from all other entities, and then select that characteristic which is the cause of these aspects. Let me give you some examples of what would happen if one ignored the rule of fundamentality. One could then define man as the animal who can weave baskets or the animal who can read French, or the animal who uses electric coffee pots, or the animal who likes movies. All these characteristics belong only to men. Lower animals don't possess them. But all these characteristics are non-essentials, and therefore all such definitions are false. These examples show the error of picking some random attribute as the differentia of a definition. Now let me give you some examples of the same kind of error, that is, ignoring the rule of fundamentality, in picking some random attribute as the genus of a, de of a definition. One could then say that a skyscraper, an oak tree, a telegraph pole, and a man over six feet tall are entities of the same kind, of the same genus, because all of them are tall. Or one could say that men, chickens, tables, and chairs are entities of the same kind, the same genus, because all of them have legs. The breach of the rule of fundamentality, the error best described as definition by non-essentials, is perhaps the most disastrous of all the errors men can make in their definitions. For instance, Certain modern sociologists and psychologists will define man as the animal with a sense of humor. Well, a sense of humor is blatantly a consequence of the fact that man possesses a mind. And more specifically, it's a consequence of certain special premises in his mind. But if a sense of humor is taken as an essential and fundamental characteristic of man, then one wouldn't have too much difficulty in arguing that a hyena is a man, because a hyena laughs. 
and one could also argue that men are hyenas. Such a claim is perhaps not too far from the intention of people who will define man in this manner. Or consider the definition of truth that's given by some members of the logical positivist school of philosophy and is propounded by them in some of our leading universities. Truth is that which is publicly verifiable. Now, it's certainly the case that that which is true can be verified publicly. But this is only a secondary, non-essential consequence of the fundamental fact that truth is that which corresponds to reality. If a statement is true, then the public who perceive the same reality, or any part of the public, or any individual, will be able to verify whether that statement does or does not correspond to reality, if they choose to verify it. But it isn't their verification, nor their sanction, that will make the statement true. It's the statement's correspondence to reality. And the standard by which one judges this correspondence is not any action of the public, but logic. You hear examples of such definitions by non-essentials constantly today. Only you may not recognize them. For example, it was a strategy of the communists, especially prevalent in the 1930s, to brand anyone who opposed them as a fascist. Fascism is, of course, the name of a particular form of political statism. In fact, it's a species of socialism. Historically, it's true that fascists and communists were often in opposition to each other, like rival gangs fighting for the same territory. But opposition to communism is scarcely the essential meaning of fascism, any more than opposition to fascism is the essential meaning of communism. But by inculcating in the public mind the notion that the meaning of fascism was opposition to communism, the communists were able to make this definition by non-essentials one of their most famous intimidating smears. Later, this technique was taken over by many liberals, so that now many of them strive to inculcate the notion that the meaning of fascism is opposition to welfare statism. Now, if you want to understand the essence of this kind of thinking, the essence of the method involved, I'll give you an example of it in its purest form. I'll read a passage from a book entitled Language and Thought in Schizophrenia. This is a collection of papers presented at a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, published by the University of California Press. This particular passage is from a paper entitled on Specific Laws of Logic in Schizophrenia, by E. Fondomaris. Quote, A schizophrenic patient of the insane asylum of the University of Bonn believed that Jesus, cigar boxes, and sex were identical. How did he arrive at that strange belief? Investigation revealed that the missing link for the connection between Jesus, cigar box, and sex was supplied by the idea of being encircled. In the opinion of this patient, the head of Jesus, as of a saint, is encircled by a halo, the package of cigars by the tax band, and the woman by the sex glance of the man. Apparently, our patient had the feeling that a saint, cigar package, and sexual life were identical. That is, the feelings which he experienced when he spoke of a saint, cigar package, or sex life were the same. The difference between normal and schizophrenic thinking seems to be that whereas for a normal person, the particular of being encircled is only one of many accidentals, for the schizophrenic patient, it is the quality expressing essence." Unquote. I think this makes graphically clear the meaning of definitions by non-essentials and why one should eliminate them from one's thinking. But this quotation mentions another crucial aspect of inefficient thinking, a mental habit responsible for a great many intellectual disasters. That is, the substitution of emotions 
for thought. The failure to distinguish thought from emotions, facts from feelings. The treating of emotions as tools of cognition, as sources of knowledge. Observe the doctor's explanation of the cause of the schizophrenic's conclusions. And I quote again. Apparently, our patient had the feeling that a saint, cigar package, and sexual life were identical. That is, the feelings which he experienced when he spoke of a saint, cigar package, or sex life were the same. Unquote. Obviously, the sole standard by which the schizophrenic judged truth, reality, identity, logic, definitions, knowledge, every aspect of awareness was his feelings. If he felt that the three objects were the same, they were the same to him. The attribute he picked to prove his belief, the attribute of encirclement, was not the result of thinking, but of rationalization. To rationalize means to pick some random explanation to justify one's feelings and stick to it regardless of reason, logic, evidence, or argument. In fact, whenever you hear a person stubbornly maintain some preposterous argument, in spite of any evidence to the contrary, you are observing a person who has suspended thought and is asserting the nonsense in order to justify some feeling which is the actual cause of his belief. A sane person doesn't suspend his thinking as frequently or as thoroughly as a schizophrenic. Nevertheless, remember that whenever and to whatever extent you allow yourself to believe that it's true because I feel it's true, you are acting on the epistemological principles of schizophrenia at that time and to that extent. A schizophrenic can't change his methods of thinking. You can. It's terribly important to distinguish very clearly in every issue what you think and what you feel, and to be on guard against any mixture of the two. This doesn't mean that you have to repress your feelings. It means only that you have to know which is a feeling and which is a rational judgment of fact. And whenever the judgment of your mind clashes with your feelings, it's the judgment of your mind, not your feelings, that you must accept as your tool of cognition, as your guide to reality. For instance, if you decide to take a certain action, because you've concluded for rational reasons that that action is right, and you find that it gives you pleasure, that's the proper relationship between thought and emotion. But if you decide that an action is right exclusively because it gives you pleasure, then you're reversing cause and effect. You're taking an emotion as a tool of perception. You're assuming that your emotion proves the action to be objectively right. The focus on one's feelings as one's primary concern is one of the crucial distorters of thought. And let me give you an example of how you might take emotions as tools of cognition without even being fully aware that that is what you're doing. Suppose you're reading a novel in which the hero seems to be an individualist and you have been starved for such a novel. In the first chapter, the hero turns down a very good job rather than conform to the ideas of others. You feel a strong emotion, an emotion of admiration and of pleasure. And this emotion, quite validly, is important to you. It's the kind of emotion you rationally do want to feel. Well, at this point, you can do one of two things. You can continue to perceive, to see what the book is about, to judge what you're reading. Or you can lose yourself in the pleasure you feel. Focus only on it. Look only for ways to maintain it, ignoring and evading any evidence that might contradict it. If you do this second, you might do it without a conscious decision. It might happen as the result of a habit of thinking, a method of perception by which over a long period of time you have granted top priority to what you feel. 
Then, as you continue to read the novel, the hero is shown establishing a socialistic cooperative, which he says will once and for all solve the problem of jobs for everyone. Well, if your mind is functioning rationally, you will perceive that you've made a mistake. That is, that whatever this book is preaching, it isn't individualism. But if you're focused on maintaining your emotion at any price, then you'll start to rationalize it by any means possible. You'll tell yourself that the hero really believes in his ideal, and this makes him an individualist. Or that he's fighting for his idea, so that he's still a hero, etc., etc., etc. And you can read the whole book this way, reading into it what you want to find, explaining away what doesn't fit your desires, blinding yourself, destroying your perception for the sake of your emotion. A year later, you might read the same book again in a different mood and ask yourself in helpless amazement, why did I think what I thought? Another mental habit that can block the efficiency of your thinking is the failure to integrate your ideas. The habit of treating your convictions on different subjects as if they had no relation to one another, as if each subject were enclosed in a separate square and suspended in a vacuum. People are able to hold the countless number of contradictory opinions which they do hold only by a failure of integration, by refusing to consider the relationship of one idea to another. For instance, if a man decides in the field of economics that free enterprise is the best system, and in the field of morality that one should be an altruist, he can do so only by a failure of integration. If you believe that you could never love a person who is worthless, but that you should be loved unconditionally, regardless of what you do or are, that is a failure of integration. If you hold that force is immoral, but you pick your neighbor's pocket, that is a failure of integration. If you believe that human beings must deal with each other rationally, but the only explanation you offer a child for your order is that you order it, that is a failure of integration. There is a particular form of the failure to integrate, which we call context dropping. For instance, if I have a quarrel with a friend, and we agree to discuss it the next evening, and on the next evening she comes in and cheerfully suggests that we go to a movie, not mentioning the quarrel, she has forgotten or evaded the context, the unsolved problem that still exists between us, and she acts as if the quarrel had never taken place. Mr. Brandon tells a story about one of his patients, who during a psychological interview came to understand certain key causes of his problems. He was very excited and happy, and he left at the end of the hour vowing that he was certain the back of his problem was broken and that he now had tremendous things to think about, and he said he'd give a full report on his thinking the following week. Next session, next week, he entered the office looking forlorn, indifferent, dejected. How are you, Mr. Brandon asked. The patient sighed, oh, I guess I'm all right. Well, said Mr. Brandon, tell me what you've been thinking about this week. The patient looked at Mr. Brandon blankly. Gazing into space, he answered offhandedly, oh, nothing much. Why do you ask? What's new with you? This is context dropping. There are still other forms of blocking the efficiency of one's thinking. And let me illustrate an important one through an example I've never forgotten. A number of years ago, when President Truman was considering the nationalization of the steel industry because of union difficulties, I talked with a man who was very much in favor of the move. I discussed with him the immorality and the economic impracticality of such an action. I cited the principles of individual rights and property rights. I cited the evils of government intervention into economics to prove my case. And I convinced him. He said that he understood my arguments clearly and that he agreed with them. 
the next week, he came and asked me why the government should not nationalize the coal industry. What this illustrates is the failure to think in principles. The attempt simply to stare at concrete facts, to understand them and to evaluate them without reference to any abstract principles. The mind that does this is what we call concrete bound. A man with a concrete bound mind considers particular issues, forgetting any theories he might know, attempting to solve problems without any principle to serve as a standard. Theories to him are only an intellectual chess game, something one plays with and talks about, but doesn't apply to reality and doesn't use in one's thinking when one tries to solve a problem. This is the man who does not see the forest for the trees. The other side of this same coin and of this same error is the man who doesn't see the trees for the forest. That is, the man who holds nothing in his head but floating abstractions. That is, abstractions which he's unable to concretize, which he believes without any idea of what they would actually mean in reality. An example of this kind of thinking is a meeting at which a political candidate declares that he stands for a balanced budget, decreased taxes, and increased government spending and his audience bursts into applause. No one who understood concretely what these abstractions meant could possibly applaud. A man who holds floating abstractions understands words not in terms of what they denote, but in terms of what they connote. Words connote things to him. They call up pleasant or unpleasant emotions, associations, memories. They suggest, they do not denote. His abstractions float in space, untied to meanings, to facts, to reality. The mind that is concrete bound and the mind that uses floating abstractions seem to be opposites. One is an unthinking babbit, the other an abstract ivory tower intellectual. But in fact, both hold the same basic premise. Both believe that there is no connection between facts and ideas, between reality and thought. And there will not be much difference in the disastrous errors of both their methods of thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, the issues that I have discussed tonight represent only some of the first steps in what is actually a new science, the science of efficient thinking. This is part of a wider discipline to which we have given the name psychoepistemology. Psychoepistemology is the study of the mental operations that characterize a man's method of dealing with reality. I have given you only a few significant leads along the road to the improvement and correction of one's thinking methods. You can readily understand that no matter how much you might learn in these 20 lectures, no matter what new knowledge you might acquire, your ability to use it, to take advantage of it, to apply it to the actual issues of your daily life can be no better than the efficiency of your thinking processes. If I could accomplish only one goal tonight, I should like at least to make you aware that there is a problem here urgently requiring your attention. I should like to make you self-conscious of your mental processes. I should like to start you on the most important task of all, to think about thinking.